Let's open our Bibles to Revelation 16. We're talking about what's fading so fast from the news. Have you noticed that it, the news about the tsunami is just, it's just, it's just dropping. It's going off the radar screens of being front page stuff. And soon it's going to just go into oblivion. Our military will soon wrap up their aid flights. And for us, who are thousands of miles from the epicenter of death and destruction, it's just back to the blur of life and the hope that everything will stay normal, right? Just, just want to just make it through life. Before that attention-grabbing event, the power that that disaster had upon us gets cleared out of our lives, kind of like the bulldozers are clearing the debris left over in the cleanup and pushing it out of sight. Before that happens in our minds, I'd like to one more time look at that amazing event. Now, we're getting conflicting reports how many people died. Official, 157, but the Indonesian government says that probably 200,000 plus just in their country alone died. And so it's going to end up being a very large event when they get done counting. But for those 157,000 people plus, their world ended. That's the first thing I want you to think about. Their world ended. The world didn't end, but their world ended. So with that in mind, before we look at the end of the world, which we're going to look at in Revelation 16 and, and the ultimate quake, I want you to think for a moment about the end of your world, you. Because that's what happened to all the people with the earthquake, right? And the tsunami. Their world ended. Now how is your world going to end? Well, probably not by a tsunami or an earthquake. That is very low down the list. What usually kills people? Have you thought about that? What are your probabilities of your cause of death? There are a lot of, you know, the insurance companies who are in the business of figuring how long people are going to live have made it a science for the last 300 years, figuring out causes of death and the probabilities and the, the amount of risk it takes in our lives. So let me just read to you some of their charts. Because globally, violence is the leading killer of people. It accounts for 14% of all deaths among men and 7 among women. It's a big hunk of uh, cause of death. On the average, 1,424 people are murdered every day. I mean, just read the Tulsa paper. We have our share. But for us who are U.S. residents, it's probably heart disease that will kill us. In fact, one in five of us here, that's about 175 of us here in this room, are going to die of heart disease, according to the people that track all that. Cancer will take one in seven, that's 125 more of us. So heart disease, one in five, one in seven, cancer. The next is stroke, that's one in 23, that's only 38 of us. Accidental injury, you know, whatever, falling, tripping, stepping out in front of a car, something like that, 24 of us, or one in 36 nationwide. A car accident, one in 100, so that means only about nine of us will probably go to glory if you're a believer in a car accident. Intentional self-harm is rising very rapidly. That's why they categorize suicide. One in 121 Americans in their lifetime will commit suicide. So that means almost every one of us who are at all outgoing will have someone in our circle who ends their life. Falling is one in 250, so about four of us will die from falls. And if you read the list, I mean, shot by a firearm, one in 325, dying, uh, you know, in your house, burning down, one in 1,100. That's not a biggie. And here's the other one, natural forces, they call it. That's a heat stroke, you know, of like Europe had last summer, the intense heat and killed a lot of people. Or uh, a cold snap like we had on the East Coast not too many years ago where 30 people died from the incredible cold. Oklahoma style tornadoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis only kill one in 3,400 people in America. So, so that means point, one third of one person here will die from a tornado or a, a tsunami in their lifetime. I added all these up and I thought, what does everybody else die of? That only accounted for about 370 people in our auditorium. Are the rest of you not going to die? And so they had another catch-all category. They called it old age. One in every one and a half people die of old age. And that means just everything wears out. So with that incredible uh, statistical analysis done, 
The devastation of the earthquake and tsunami three weeks ago, it's only been three weeks and already it's fading, has given us a tiny insight into what the world is going to be like at the end. Let me show you the ultimate quake in Revelation 16, verse 17. Some of you wondered where it was. Because the quake that just struck, the quake of 2004, will go down in history as a major event. But it goes down in divine history as a gracious reminder from the Lord about what we're really here on earth for. We're really here on earth to get ready to meet God. That's really, if you want to know, bottom line, what you're on earth for, it's to get you ready. God is giving you time, breath after breath, to get ready to stand in front of him. And you know, a lot of people don't really spend their time getting ready. And this earthquake and tsunami rattles us because we're not used to a thousand mile long piece of the earth's surface moving a hundred feet and that's what happened I mean, it was a huge event but as far as events go it wasn't the largest earthquake on record before we read revelation sixteen twenty, remember this quake was not the biggest it was number four of the recorded measured quakes now There have been great quakes in the past, but they didn't have the measuring instruments, so the guess at them. But of the last century, uh, in 1960, there was a large quake. In 1957 and 1964, in Alaska and Chile, those three quakes, which were much, much larger than this one. So it wasn't the biggest quake, and it wasn't the deadliest quake on record. The deadliest quake on record is right here. And I want you just to follow along. I'm going to read it to you, okay? Revelation 16, 17. This is going to be the ultimate earthquake of all earthquakes. They say that they can't imagine an earthquake above 10. The one that just struck was 9. The largest one on record is 9.5 on the Richter scale. Scientists say they cannot imagine the earth getting above a 10 on the Richter scale. So if that's true... Here it is, okay? Verse 17. And the seventh angel, Revelation 16, 17, poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple in heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises, and thunderings, and lightnings. And there was, here it is, a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Now, that's quite a big statement. You know, God is not an exaggerator. That means cities all over the planet fell. There's never been an earthquake that was felt to that extent around the planet. Yes, our whole planet vibrated on the last one, but it it didn't knock anything over here. This one is going to be so big that cities all over the planet are going to fall. I mean, just kind of like I was looking down the quakes here. There was a a quake in Japan that killed 125,000 people in our century. Within the last 100 years, it was in 1923. 125,000 in one city in Japan. I mean, we're talking, this one is going to knock down city after city after city. I'll keep reading. It says this, the cities fell in the middle of 19 and great Babylon was remembered before God and to her, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. But look at verse 20 and every, notice what it says, every, God doesn't exaggerate, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. You know, Sumatra moved a hundred feet. That island kind of skittered. Every island is going to flee away. That means there's going to be an unbelievable movement, tectonic movement of the earth's crust. And while all that's happening, while everybody, you know what you're supposed to do in an earthquake? Any of you live in California? You know what you're supposed to do in an earthquake? Run outside of your house, or if you're stuck, you stand in the doorway. Here you guys get in the bathtubs, okay, for tornadoes. Different setup in California. You stand in the doorway, kind of like Samson, you know, holding it. Or you run outside so nothing falls on you, but you don't go too far outside so stuff doesn't fall on you that's falling. I mean, it's really complicated to live in California. 
But the people that run outside because of the earthquake, look what's going to happen to them. Verse 21, And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. How much does a talent weigh? Between 60 and 100 pounds. Imagine a ball of ice the size of 12 gallons of milk. You know, a gallon of milk weighs 8 pounds. So we're talking about get, you know, get 12 milk cartons together and make a ball out of them, and that's how big that hailstone's going to be. All over the earth. And look at the result. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceeding great. I mean, God's pulling out the stops, getting them ready for the end, and they're damning his name to the end. That's humanity. Well, the quake that just happened wasn't the largest. It wasn't the deadliest. This is the deadliest. But it was awesome. A thousand kilometer long, hundred kilometer wide strip of land moved a hundred feet. The deadliest quake we know of was in China in 1556. It killed 830,000 people in one earthquake. Uh, Another one in 1737 in Calcutta killed 300,000. In China in 1976, while we were celebrating, it was right after our 4th of July celebration here. Any of you old enough to remember the great 200th anniversary of the United States? While we were celebrating that, two weeks later, an earthquake struck China that killed 255,000 people and we didn't hardly notice it because we were still thinking about our great 200th. August of uh, 1138 in Syria a quarter million died. In 1927 in China 200,000 died. In December of 856, 200,000 died in Iran. And in 1920, in China, 200,000 died. So those are the top 10 earthquakes in history of devastation and death. But as we go back to Luke 21, I'm going to read the whole thing with you. Last time we ended and I didn't get to read the whole passage. But in Luke 21, I pointed out the sobering aspect of the end of the world is these multiplied earthquakes. Jesus said that like a woman in birth pangs, and since I have not gone through that but watched it eight times, you notice that the pains get intense and closer together. They grow in intensity and they grow in frequency. That's the, in the, the reminder that the baby is coming. And Jesus said, the reminder that I'm coming is stuff that's going on all the time around the world. Famines, pestilence, plagues, wars, rumors of wars, and earthquakes are going to get more intense and closer together. But he said, that's just going to happen. It's not like if you keep a chart of them on your wall, you're going to know just when the Lord's going to come. He said it's just going to be the everyday stuff in life. They're just going to get more frequent and intense. Well, they get to the point of intensity. We saw last week that people are going to be, their hearts failing them because of the roaring of the waves. And I told you that enough people die in the tribulation time, it would be like having 16 tsunamis a day for three and a half years. So just remember that. But what gets me about this is that Jesus is telling us in this passage there's something we can learn a thousand or two years before the event because he shared it with his disciples. And what I want to do with you is show you how to mine out of the scriptures something that can impact your life as God tells us what the end of the world is going to be like. Luke 21, if you want to follow along, I'm going to start reading in verse 7. And you listen as I read. And they ask him, saying, Teacher, Luke 21, 7, when will these things be? And what are the signs going to be when these things are about to take place? By the way, Jews look for signs. We seek a Savior. Remember that. Paul said the Jews always are looking for a sign. But he said the church looks for the Savior. We aren't looking for a sign. I mean, if something happens in Europe, it doesn't mean Jesus is is coming back because of that. We look for him, not for a sign. We're not supposed to be fanatic prophecy nuts. We're supposed to be holy witnesses and priests. Okay, so watch out for the sign thing. Verse 8, and he said, take heed that you don't be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And the time, as the time draws near, therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, don't be terrified. 
For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. He's, he's warning. Don't get all caught up in, in, in this sign thing and getting on your roof and selling everything and saying, I think it's today. The church has gotten in trouble for centuries, millennia, doing that, setting signs or, or setting dates because of signs. Verse 10, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. By the way, nation is ethne against ethne. That's growing. There are more ethnic conflicts on this planet. You know, the, 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 you, you know about them. You know, the Serbian, the whole thing that was going on in Yugoslavia, and now the whole Chechnyan thing, and then the whole thing going on in Rwanda. It's never been that intense as it is now. He says, yep, that's going to be there, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places. We just saw one, famines and pestilence. You know, Dufour and all the people dying, starving to death, pestilences. There are a million infected with AIDS in Russia right now, triple what they thought. They're even making, now our team going to Russia has to have a, a certificate saying they're AIDS free. That's how bad our world's getting with these pestilences. There will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Uh-huh, verse 12. And before all these things, they'll lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up in the synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and rulers. But it will turn out for you, verse 13, as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle in your heart not to meditate beforehand what you'll answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict. And you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will be lost. That's a staggering paradox. You're going to be delivered up and murdered, but your hair will, you know, he's not saying that. He's not saying they're going to kill all of you, but your hair. (laughs) That one doesn't apply to me. What he's saying is that you are immortal, invincible. Christians never die. They can kill the tent, but you're alive inside and will live forever. So it's really a promise of security that he's with us. Verse 19, in your patience, possess your souls. Don't get anxious and fearful. Then he goes into a little historic thing. He's prophesying an event 40 years after he spoke, the destruction of Jerusalem. That goes from verse 20 down through verse 24. Uh, And that literally happened just like he said. And by the way, the Jews, the believing Jews that, that knew this passage, when they saw the armies coming, they left. And the Christian community, by and large, was not destroyed in A.D. 70 because they believe the Bible. But picking up at verse 25, he gets back to the future again, the future to us, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity. That's an interesting word. means they don't know how to escape. What's, you know, there's, just, there's no way out. The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear. And the expectation, the dread of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things, now here's the, here's the word for us. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them to a parable, verse 29. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, a lot of dispute. What is a generation? 40 years, 20, 30 years? In the Old Testament, it was as much as 100 years. But this isn't even probably the word for generation. It's actually used in Philippians for nation or people. So it could be the Jews won't be gone, but you know, they won't be, all be killed off. Or it could be the generation that's alive when this begins will live to the end of it. It, it, it doesn't mean that 40 years from 1948 or 1967 or 1973 or whatever. It, it is not saying that because he's talking to Jewish people, not to us, to count out and figure out when Christ is coming back. So... I hope that doesn't ruin your chart. But, but what he says is, heaven and earth, verse 33, will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Here is the application for us, verse 34, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. Do you ever feel bogged down by life? 
Don't you sometimes say, man, I wish I had more time. I'd learn those verses. I wish I had more time. I'd sing in the choir, but I don't have time. I've got to work and do all that. I wish I had more time. I'd help in the nursery and the children's ministry. I wish I had more time. I would go out. I would go on a mission trip, but I'm weighed down. Look what he says. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. And then he talks about some dangers, carousing, drunkenness. Here's one that, you know, we might not have the first two predominant, but what about weighed down with the cares of this life? You know, the more stuff you own, the more stuff you have to clean and store and protect and guard and move around and worry about and insure and then give to someone or sell before they get it from you, right? The cares of this life weigh us down and that day come on you unexpectedly for it will come like a snare to all those who dwell in the face of the whole earth and here's Jesus' twofold command. Watch, therefore, present, active, imperative, I command you. Interesting word. A hupneo, like hypnotize. A, alpha privative, means negative, don't. Hupneo, get hypnotized. You know what he's saying? Don't get hypnotized. Watch. Don't get lulled to sleep. He's thinking everybody... Everything's going great. Life's going good. We're on plan. I'm going to retire and the kids are going to, and I'm going to have grandkids and wow, I'm going to be able to. Don't get hypnotized by all that. Pray. Interesting word for pray. It's the word beg God. Beg, deomai. Beg always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. We're supposed to be begging God to get us ready for the greatest day of our life. Earthquakes, disasters, death, coming for all of us, should remind us what we're really here for. Let's bow before the Lord and ask him. Lord, we pray. We beg you, debt oh my, we plead and implore that you would, in a very powerful, real way, get a hold of our hearts this morning to know what we should be doing our few days on earth. Our lives are but a vapor. One in seven cancer, one in five heart disease, one in every one and a half, everything's going to wear out. We're frail and fragile, and death is inevitable unless we have the glorious trumpet sound and we meet you in the air. But for the vast majority of all believers of all time, death is inevitable. And it's the beginning of our standing before you. Help us from Luke 21 in your precious sermon, your longest sermon on prophecy, to learn how you want us to live, expectant of the end of the world and our world. Open our hearts, stir our wills, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would encourage you either to get your pen out and either write in your Bible or on the back of your bulletin because I want to show you how to apply this. A lot of people, they don't like prophecy. It's it all confusing. Or else they're overboard in prophecy and everything is prophetic. And there's a wonderful in-between ground where you can allow prophetic scripture to be applied to your heart. And let me show you what I mean. Um, first of all, this is Jesus talking to Israel, to the Jews, about their future. Not our future. It, it, this, this whole thing is set in Jerusalem, Judea. If you're in Jerusalem, flee to the hills. Those in Judea, you know, da 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 da. It's not a metaphor or a symbol or an allegory. It's literally Christ's warning to his people. You know what it tells me? The Jewish people are going to be around to the end. I already knew that. The whole Bible says that. God is not through with Israel. And no coalition of nations or Islamic force can wipe them out. Because God said, those are my chosen people. That's not us. We are not Israel. We are not the Jews. We are not replacing them. God has separate, distinct plans. This is his plan for them. It's not for us. So just with that in mind, what he's saying, look at verse 8 of Luke 21. Watch out for religious deception. He says, be not deceived. And, and he's admonishing them. He's talking to the apostles and to the believers after that and to the believing Jews in the, in the final days. And he's saying to all of them, which we are included, Watch out, you don't get deceived. You know how you don't get deceived? You know the truth. 
You study doctrine. You understand the Bible. You don't just accept things. When Paul used to preach, they didn't accept what he said. They checked the Old Testament scriptures to see if he was accurate. And if they checked Paul, then you ought to check everyone. Acts 17.11 ought to be over you know, the, the doorway of, of wherever you study the Bible, that you're always going to check out what you hear in church, in Sunday school, on the radio, on a tape, in a book, and make sure that it's squaring with the Scripture. That's our responsibility because, watch out, Jesus is warning even that God's people could be in danger of being deceived. Satan has always been a counterfeiter. He's always led people astray for centuries. That's his plan. Now, for some examples, think just in America. The originators and propagators of all the false cults which have arisen throughout the course of the age have always been with us, but we've had a rash of them from here that are deceivers, just to name a few. The made in America deceivers are the Jehovah's Witnesses and all of their falseness about Christ and who he is and his person and character and deity the mormons christian science you know i could go into to so many other weirdo modern ones scientology and all these other things there are many deceivers be on guard what a peril they are then look at verse nine he says don't be anxious about global distresses i mean every time you you, and by the way you're going to hear about more of them not necessarily because there are more it's because The world is getting wired together for the end. Part of the end days is that everyone will see events as they happen. That's what Revelation 11 says. That everyone's going to see, at the same time, global events. And it's never been possible until recently. It wasn't possible until satellites. You know, 1960, when the the satellites started. And then, when they started understanding about the, the Internet after 20 years after that, finally we have a global close networking but there's going to be more and more distresses because we're more and more aware of everything going on everywhere Uh, look at verse uh, 12 there's going to be religious persecution and christ says don't fear that and then he goes through and talks about how he comes to rescue israel so that's all the 21st chapter but what i'd like you to write down is lessons from all these okay here's the first one go back to verse 8 he says take heed that you be not deceived now, he was, ta- he was looking at his apostles. And they recorded this through the Holy Spirit. Luke recorded what Jesus said to his apostles. And you know what? It counts for us today. He commands us, take heed that you not be deceived. You know what the first resolve I have is? I wrote, write down in my Bible, I will know God's word so I won't be deceived. And I've set down as a life's goal to know God's word so that, do you know how you spot a counterfeit? Not by studying studying counterfeits, by studying the genuine article. When you study the genuine, when you see something fake, it just just jumps out at you. You know the greatest way to keep from being deceived is to do John 8.32, okay? Go to the next book. Keep your finger here and go to John 8.32. There's a verse to reference or note or put in your margin or something. This is what it says. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you know what sets you free from deception and fear and, and confusion and anxiety? Knowing the truth. Here's a lesson for all of you. Your life right now can be measured as a reflection of what you believe to be true about God. If you are fearful, you don't believe in the God as he's revealed in the scriptures. The one who promised he would never leave you or forsake you. Now, I don't mind when I'm on my knees at night praying with my buddies who are little tiny, you know, 5, 7, 9, 11. I don't mind telling them, okay, It's okay if it's dark, you know, because God promised you. you I can keep reminding them that and turn a light on for them because they're little and they're learning. When you have a 30-year-old person that's afraid of everything, they have a deficient understanding of the person and nature and character and promises of God. There is something marvelous to go through life knowing that God 
is walking before me. He is behind me. He is over me. And underneath me are his everlasting arms. And we are invulnerable. Not Superman's. He can get kryptonite or whatever it is. You and I are truly invulnerable. Because God says nothing will befall you except what is for my good. And he says, I'm underneath you and up above you and all around you and surrounding you. I'm going before you. I'm always with you. And if you know that truth, it'll set you free. And so how do we keep from being deceived? Here's another one. Just write it down. Acts 17, 11. The Bereans received the word with all readiness. And verse 11 of Acts 17 says, they searched the scriptures to find out whether these things were so. We would be much more prepared as believers if instead of trusting the biggies to do all the studying and to write the books and we just have the book there, we disciplined ourselves to study things from the scripture ourselves one at a time. You should know where the Trinity is in the Bible, not by getting a Bible dictionary, but because you have looked up the verses and found it yourself. You should know where the deity of Christ is expressed in the Bible because you found it yourself. And you should know what the Bible says about assurance and whether you can lose your salvation. It's okay. You can call me as much as you want and all the staff here, and you can just go to the library, but you should finally get around to getting the basics for the Christian life down. I have a never-ending list that I keep in the back, you know, those blank pages they always put in the backs of your Bible. And I am always finding lists of verses about assurance and for, because I always want to know people are so concerned, especially in the hospitals, you know, and they're just, it's a lifelong process to know the truth and study it for ourselves. Not let someone else do it for you. All I'm supposed to do is be a cheerleader to encourage you to be built up in the word. You have to engage yourself And Jesus said, you individually, I want you not to be deceived. And you should resolve, I will know the truth. I'm going to systematically this year read through the Bible and look for one thing all the way through. First time I read through the Bible, I marked every single name of God with a highlighter. Next time I went through, I went through every prayer in the Bible and marked it. Next time I went through, I went through every prophetic thing in the Bible. Next time, everything about the family and then every person and then every play. And just started studying each one for myself. You need to be careful. Deceptive times are coming. Go on down to verse 9. When you hear of wars and commotions, this is chapter 21 of Luke, verse 9. Don't be terrified. He said, don't be terrified. Don't live in fear. Don't be afraid to drive because drive by shootings. Don't be afraid to go in parts of town because, because, you know, it's just getting more dangerous. Don't be afraid to travel because you're going to be hijacked. Don't be afraid. It's the most repeated negative prohibition in the Bible. Fear not. God's people don't live in fear. You know, one of the right next to sodomites and witchcrafts and murderers and effeminate and abusers and all those. Do you know what's right in there with that horrible list of those people that are going to be in hell? Do you know what's next to them? The fearful. In God's mind, fearfulness is right next to witchcraft and murder because it is the realm of the devil satan likes to keep people their whole life afraid and jesus christ came to deliver those hebrews 2 says who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage and he says if you know the truth you'll be set free so what's our resolve resolve i will trust god's promises so i won't live a fearful life here's a verse to write, write down in your notes and i'll read it to you second timothy 1 12 through 14 for the, this reason i suffer these things paul said nevertheless i'm not ashamed for i know who i have believed and i am persuaded he is able to keep what i committed to him until that day hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, and that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. You know what he's saying? Don't be afraid. Trust the one that that you have committed yourself to and resolve, I will trust God's promises so I won't live in fear. Keep going on down to verse 14 of chapter 21. Jesus said this, Therefore settle in your hearts not to meditate beforehand what you will answer. He's talking about the Jews, uh, which were going to be hauled into synagogues, which happened, you know, in Acts. And then he's talking about the fact that 
all the way through history we've been persecuted. And then in the end, there's going to be ultimate persecution where they're going to be, remember, beheading all the believers in the book of Revelation. It talks about all them, you know, up there uh, under the throne who had been beheaded for their testimony of Christ. So this is specifically to them. But look back at that, at that 14th verse. Settle in your hearts not to meditate what you will answer. Look at verse 13. It's going to turn out for an occasion for a testimony. Here's another resolve, the third one, okay? Number one, I resolve I'm going to know the truth so I don't get deceived. Number two, I'm going to trust God's promises so I don't live in fear. The third one is, I resolve I'm going to speak for Jesus in any circumstance. Have you come to that place yet? Where you'll speak for Christ at work? Not on company time going into these long, you know, things that are robbing your employer of his rightful work from you. When I was, I was a corporate salesman, I used to have the people from New York come and ride with me. And you know what I told them? I said, lunch hour is my time. And so I'm going to, because they would always ask me, you know, they'd say, you're different. I say, yeah, I am. I'm a Christian. These were all New York Jews. And I said, now I want to talk to you about it, but I'm going to talk about it at lunch because I don't talk on company time because I honor you as management. And boy, did they get both barrels at lunch. Most of the New Yorkers only ate lunch with me once, you know, because it was my time. And I could use it as an occasion to witness. I mean, you can, you can talk. I, I, I talk to people wherever I am and ask the Lord to open the, the door for that so that we can use it. So resolve, I will speak for Jesus in any circumstance. Here's two verses to write down. Acts 4.31. Uh, look at Luke's sequel, okay? Move in your Bible over to Acts 4. Keep your finger in Luke 21. And look at Acts 4 and verse 31. I love this. Here they are getting in, in trouble. They're forbidden. Peter and John are arrested and, and they're they're really roughed up, and look what happens in verse 31. They run back to the believers, and they have a prayer meeting, and when they had prayed, Acts 4.31, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at this. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know what? We need an ongoing filling because the evidence of fullness is boldness to speak, not to think, not to wonder, not to hope, not to silently stick a track under their door. That's all good. It's to speak. A verbal witness is the, is the result of a fullness of the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean we're all as good as some. Don Locke was an evangelist. He could lead... He could lead people to the Lord that were putting gas in his car. I mean, he, he, just, he just was an unbelievable guy. 99% of you aren't that way. But we can have a fullness of the Holy Spirit so that at a propitious time, at an appropriate moment, when something happens, when, when people look at us with, with wondering about the Lord, we speak for them the glorious word of Jesus Christ to them. And what we have to do is ask for boldness. Look at chapter 5, verse 20 of Acts. Just turn over the page. Here they are. They're in prison. And the Holy Spirit fills them up and the angel of the Lord comes and opens the doors. And look at what they're told. Uh, Verse 19, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And this is what the angel of the Lord said. Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Wow. Resolve in your heart, I'm going to speak for the Lord in any circumstance. And ask for fullness of the Holy Spirit, and you'll know that you have a filling when you are bold. Not foolish. I've met some people that they were, they were standing at the head of a line, and they were earnestly talking with the cashier, about the Lord, and the cashier is looking at the manager, looking at the line, looking at them, looking at their cash register, and that it's not, it's not wise to put people in an uncomfortable place because you corner them. It's not, it, this isn't cornering. This is Holy Spirit prompted boldness to give an effective word. And I will purpose to speak for Jesus. Keep going down to verse 16. 
of chapter 21 of Luke because we're getting more lessons from Christ's message. Number one is I'm not going to be deceived. Number two, I'm going to trust his promises and not live fearfully. Number three, I'm going to speak for Jesus in any circumstance. Verse 16 has the fourth one. You'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they'll put some of you to death. That's what's happening all over the world. That's what's happening in Muslim countries. That's what's happening in, in India. That's what's happening in all of the, the regions that persecution is rampant. People are being betrayed. They're being delivered up. They're being turned in. What's the lesson here? I will purpose to never quit, even when those closest to me fail me. If you live long enough, someone close to you is going to fail you. People, people that stand for Jesus Christ do horrible things sometimes. And they fail us. They disappoint us. You know what? You stand for Christ no matter what they do. That's what we have to remember. Two verses to to write down. Mark 13, 13. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures the end will be saved. Jesus said in the parallel account, I'm going to serve the Lord even if everybody else doesn't. I'm not going to wait for them to, and then I will. I'm not going to hang on them and you know, be as bold as they are, I'm going to have a direct personal connection. I'm going to not quit even if they fail. And that's what we need to do. Did you know, every time there's a disturbance in Tulsa, in a church, everyone just peels off. Have you noticed that? The church shuffle. I mean, Tulsa's just, and I'm not picking on Tulsa, it's everywhere in the country. As soon as, you know, they don't do it, you, you just peel off and go somewhere else. And what it looks like is you are following the man instead of following the Lord. I think Jesus still attends church there. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't leave. He stays. It's just an amazing thing. And then it causes all the hypocrites and all the scoffers to to point at the church and say, they can't even get along. How can I listen to them? He says, no, no, I purpose to never quit even when those closest to me fail me. True believers are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. This also speaks of what we call the the fact that true believers never stop believing. Uh, Also, you can say theologically, they persevere. How do they do that? Do they do it by gritting their teeth? No, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. A true believer never stops believing. They endure to the end, as Jesus said. And that's part of his promise to us. We're kept, Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 5, by the power of God through faith. We are participating unto salvation. Real quickly, look at verse 17 of Luke 21. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake. You know what I wrote in my Bible? I will expect that life will be hard and full of trials. Did you know we're kind of in a bubble in America? Things are so good here. I mean, I have 20 different Christian bookstores to choose from. I have thousands of, of websites to choose from. I have thousands of Christian books. I have endless, endless stuff. I mean, when we travel, we go from one big church to another and, and just, you know, enjoy seeing the saints worshiping. We're in a bubble. It's not like that in the rest of the world. People look at us and they say, you don't know what you have. And we don't. And what we need to realize is that life is hard and full of troubles, except for us that are in this little bubble right now. And we think, you know, our physical troubles and our health and our vicissitudes and jobs are hard. A lot of people are struggling to even continue as a believer because they are so abused by their families and by their culture and everything else. So what do we do about that? Here's a verse to write down, 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12. I will expect that life will be hard and full of trials. I'm going to expect that. I'm going to prepare for that. I'm not going to plan to have an easy life. In fact, Bonnie and I were riding last night. She said, honey, I never plan to retire. I said, I don't either. I I said, I I know one thing. I'm going to serve the Lord my whole life. The guy before me at Quidneset, I was a young 32-year-old. I wonder why they wanted me so badly to come there uh, years back in in Rhode Island. I found out after I got there, their last pastor was preaching about the coming of the Lord, and he went, and the Lord will come. And then he just dropped. And they all thought, wow, what a clever device. I think some people even clapped. They thought it was one of the most remarkable endings of his sermon. He had a heart attack. He fell under the pulpit and died. And they said, we've got to have a younger one. So they got me. 
And I was careful. Every time I pounded the pulpit, people would go. You know, one time I really was tempted to just drop out of sight, but they might have clapped, and I wouldn't have liked that. So uh, I will expect life will be hard and full of trials because all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. Number one, have you resolved you won't be deceived? It's not too late to start reading through this book or listening through this book or studying through this book. Have you decided that you're not going to live in fear? Then start having a proper view of God. Know who he is. Know what he said about himself. Believe what he says about himself. And you will find a friend that will never leave you and is always with you. Decide that you are going to speak for Jesus in any circumstance. And you're not going to quit when even those closest to you fail you. And also, decide that you are going to be one that says life is hard and full of trials. And I'm not going to let them wear me down. I'm going to let them refine my life so I can be a blessing to others. That's what Jesus applied to us, his sermon on the end of the world. Let's bow before him in prayer and ask him to work in our hearts. We bow before you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your message. Thank you for giving it to us. Thank you that we can hear you speak in our language when we read your book. I pray that we would be guarding our hearts from deception that we would be guarding our lives from quitting, that we would shut the door to fear, that we would open our mouths to speak, and that we would expect life is going to be hard and we rejoice anyway. I pray that we would allow your spirit to change us so we can get ready to stand before you. Lord Jesus, we ask. In the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.